That was a great song, and it ties in perfectly with what we'll be studying tonight in the book of Colossians. So if you would, join me in standing for the reading of God's Word. Colossians chapter number 1 is where we'll be tonight. Colossians chapter number 1. And we'll begin reading in verse number 5. Colossians 1, verse 5. And let me just real quickly just welcome all of our guests once again. And just uh, say thank you for uh, visiting us and uh, viewing our campus. And we're so glad to welcome you here for our college days. I'm so thankful for West Coast Baptist College and what it's meant for my life, uh, for the teaching that I received here, for the mentors that I was able to uh, glean from while I was here. Uh, but probably one of the greatest things I received from West Coast Baptist College was my wife. And that was, that was pretty awesome. That was a perk. And uh, so I'm so thankful that she had a family that was raising her to walk with the Lord and sent her here. And uh, I truly am thankful for the college and hopefully you enjoy uh, your time here with us. Colossians chapter number one and verse number five, we read, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come to you as it is in the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth, as ye also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the privilege that we have to open your word this evening. May you speak to our hearts tonight. Father, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, I pray that they would enter into a relationship with you. And I, I pray that tonight we would walk away with this, from this passage, knowing that we are blessed to live for you, blessed to serve you. And may we endeavor to do that with our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, there are a lot of great expectations this football season. If you're a fan of football, in particular of Aaron Rodgers, who was traded to the Jets, there was a hot, lot of hype around Aaron Rodgers. And uh, if you watched the Monday night game where Aaron Rodgers came out, it's a pretty awesome moment. He's carrying our flag onto the field. Here's a few news clippings from the night. Aaron Rodgers and his Jets' expectations. There was a lot of analysis after, uh, of around how well he would do. Jerry Rice said he knew exactly how Aaron Rodgers felt, and he thinks that he will save the Jets' organization. Well, if you follow football or you happen to catch the game, you knew what happened next. They, they didn't even get to complete a set of downs, and Aaron Rodgers himself was down on the field, and that was perhaps the end of the season. We'll see. Great expectations that were unmet. You know, we all have expectations in life, things that we think are going to happen a certain way, but then don't exactly pan out how we would like them to. Uh, this afternoon, I was told by a coworker that he would bring me coffee. He was making a visit. And I, I believed him to be a man of God and a man of his word, and that he would, in fact, deliver a coffee to me. And uh, this afternoon, as I failed to see the coffee, I sent him this text and uh, <laughs> said, thanks, thanks so much for the coffee. That was a real blessing. Included a verse there that hope deferred makes the heart sick. So pray with me. I'm battling a little, a little bit of bitterness here. Won't name any names. Jacob Fleming, okay, I will name names. <laughs> expectations. And sometimes we have expectations of ourselves. I remember being in college and we had a preaching competition and they had time slots that were available and I was so nervous. I didn't want anyone to come and see me. So I, I picked one of the really late spots. I remember going into the North Auditorium to preach. Dr. Getch was in the back, and I felt pretty good about my sermon. I had high expectations for my sermon. And as I'm preaching around 2 in the morning uh, to an empty auditorium, I look back, and Dr. Getch was asleep. 
Not exactly how I imagined it going. I'm like, should I wake him? Should I just leave? You know, clearly, clearly. So I have expectations that you'll stay awake tonight, right? Expectations. The Apostle Paul, he's writing this letter that we just read to new believers in Colossae. And he's writing, and you can sense in his writing this hopeful expectation. He's not personally interacted with these particular believers, but it's obvious that he has a heart to see these new believers flourish. In verse number three, we read that he wrote, I pray for you often. Verse number four, since I first heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and love. In verse number seven, uh, how did they hear of that faith? Because of the faithful servant of a uh, uh, message of the fellow servant of Epaphras, this faithful minister of Christ. And verse number five, we read for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of, of the truth of the gospel. And so if you're taking notes tonight, notice with me, first of all, this upward hope or this upward expectation. So this hope, this expectation that the Apostle Paul has for these believers is, is different than how we speak of hope. We speak of hope in our world very loosely. I remember I, Walter Isaac, Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs. Towards the end of the biography, he was speaking about how when Steve Jobs was faced with death, he was estimating that the odds uh, of his odds of an afterlife were about 50-50. I'm believing in God. I really wanted it uh, to believe that something survived, that maybe your consciousness endures. And later on, Steve Jobs' wor words were that I hope, I hope, we use hope very loosely in, in our English currency, right? We say, you know, I, I, I hope it doesn't rain, even though we know there's a 50-50 chance it's going to rain. I, I hope I don't get pulled over for speeding, even though I was speeding, right? We use this word kind of loosely, but the biblical concept of hope is an earnest expectation, a const, uh, confident expectation. Let me tell you something. There is a deficit of hope in our world because there is an abundance of sin, abundance of self, abundance of lies, and an absence of truth. And so here in this moment, though, the Apostle Paul does have hope for these believers and for these new believers. And so we see a few things that this hope does. This hope, first of all, it settles hearts. Paul wrote, and it was common in all of his letters, grace be unto you and peace. Now, this is more than just, just fluff. These are more than just words that Paul would just include. The implication here is that these believers would be settled. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, giveth I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Uh, Kamala Harris gave a commencement address earlier this year at West Point, and she told the cadets, welcome to an unsettled world. Welcome to an unsettled world. On this point, I would agree with our vice president that our world is unsettled, but it is unsettled because of sin. The devil would love to see everything in your heart become unsettled. The truth that has uh, been communicated to you, uh, those of you that are visiting the high school students that are there with us or college students, the, the devil would love to unsettle everything that the Lord would love to settle in your heart. And by the way, this is not just a message for newer Christians. You go towards the end of the passage and you read in verse number 23, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled. So it is the truth of God and the gospel that settles us. And that is our hope. That's what settles us. The hope that we have and the promises found in Jesus Christ. Now, it's okay to have questions. And it's okay to uh, pop the hood of your faith, especially when you're in junior high and senior high and in the college years, to know what it is and why you believe it. I think that's a, a good reason uh, to attend a place like West Coast Baptist College, to get that foundation and to get settled. This is what Paul is saying, that grace and peace you, that your hearts would be settled. See, the gospel settles our hearts. Uh, uh, this is how we have peace with God. Have you ever watched a nail biter of a football game, but you already knew the outcome of that game? It's not a nail biter anymore. And the gospel tells us who's victorious in the end. Jesus has defeated hell, death, and the grave. We are victorious. And because of the truth of the gospel, we can see a news clipping that's disturbing, but we are not unsettled in our faith because we're settled in the truth of the gospel. So this hope, it settles our heart 
But then it also shapes our perspective. This hope shapes our perspective. If you were to visit, uh, if you were to visit Colossae today, there's not really much to see. Uh, just a few ruins left over. Uh, Colossae was destroyed uh, in an earthquake. Uh, it was probably before John wrote Revelation. Colossae was near Laodicea, but it's not mentioned in the letters to the churches by John in Revelation. And so there's nothing, nothing there anymore. But for the residents of Colossae at the time, they belonged to the greatest empire on earth, the Roman Empire. And Rome promised a lot of things. Rome promised prosperity. Rome promised peace. Uh, Rome uh, promised uh, uh, luxury. The poet Horace wrote, O Caesar has brought back fertile crops to the fields, has wiped away our sins, and revived the ancient virtue. Now what Paul is writing here, writing to these believers who are in the midst of an ancient, uh, uh, this world power, the Roman Empire, as Paul is writing to them, he's not directing their hope to Rome. He's not directing their hope to the government. He's not directing their hope to politics. He directs their hope to a higher power. He directs their hope to heaven in verse number five. You see, Rome made promises that Caesar couldn't deliver. Rome can't offer peace. Rome can't offer prosperity. And Rome cannot offer forgiveness of sins. It is only in Jesus. And this is what the Apostle Paul is communicating through this letter. You see, the Colossians... They were in a Roman world, not just were they in a Roman world subject to Caesar. They were Christians. They were Christ followers living in Christ's domain. Listen, as believers, our allegiance is to God. Amen. And this is when the Apostle Paul opens this letter. He, he identifies himself as a servant of Christ. If you turn on the news today, everything, everything's all of a sudden just a gray issue, right? Maybe not all of a sudden. Everything's a gray issue. Every political event, every news event, every world war, it's a gray issue. There's both sides, and you've got you to hear the side, and you've got to hear the side. One of the things that's so refreshing about the gospel and the way that Paul writes is it's a black and white issue. In fact, he uses uh, this phrase, as, uh, darkness and light. It is Jesus who translated us from darkness to light. Listen, the world is confusing because there's no hope. When the government's your hope, that's really confusing, Right? You turn on the news, that's really confusing. When you put your hope in your, your, your bank account, that's also really confusing, right? Like if you look, check your balance of your bank, yeah, that's confusing as well. Our hope is found in Jesus Christ. And so Paul wrote plainly, plainly in this perspective that, uh, yes, he was incredibly uh, educated, but this truth was simple, that there was darkness and there was light and there is Jesus towering over it all. What a great perspective. Listen, when everyone's looking down, we walk around, everyone's looking down, look up. That's where our hope is. Let's look to Jesus. Let's look to our hope. By the way, we can't get mad at a world living without hope. They're living like hopeless people do. I heard the story back in the 1800s of a, of a town called Flagstaff, Maine. And Flagstaff, Maine was told by the Central Maine Power Company that their, flound, their town would be flooded and there would be a dam that was built uh, to create this hydroelectric plant. And they were going to lose their town. They gave them a one-year warning. You know what happened over the course of the year? They stopped repairing fences. They stopped painting their houses. They stopped mowing their lawns. Why? Because they knew there was no future. Where there's no, and they wrote in the newspaper, where there's no uh, hope where there's no future, there's no hope for today. Listen, we can't get upset at a world that doesn't know Christ. We need to take them the light of the gospel and show them the hope. This is why Paul's writing this. He has experienced the glorious light of the gospel. He has a relationship with Jesus and he's excited for others to enter into that relationship and he wants them to grow. Hebrews 6, 19 says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. There's an effect that NASA named, they coined this effect, it's called the overview effect. The overview effect. And the overview effect is the effect you receive when you go up into space and you see the earth suspended in space for the first time. William Shatner went up to space and he came back down and he was speechless for a while speaking to Jeff Bezos who sponsored the trip to outer space. And Shatner said, 
What you have given me is the most profound experience I can imagine. It's extraordinary. Extraordinary. And I hope I never recover from this. Alan Shepard, the first American in space, wrote, No one could be briefed well enough to be completely prepared for the astonishing view that I got. The overview. Listen, listen to this. When you catch a glimpse of Jesus, nothing compares. Your perspective changes. Get a hold of his promises and it changes everything. What are we talking about? We're looking at verse number 14. He's the one who delivered us from the power of darkness. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Catch a glimpse of Jesus. Let these words sink into your head. Know who he is and what he's done for you. And it changes everything. You see, these truths were contrary to the Roman worldview. The Roman worldview was, was again, peace. I think even their coin, that this was during the time of the Pax Romana. The coin was all about uh, the symbol of, of peace. Rome couldn't offer peace, prosperity, and atonement. And I think it's interesting in verse number 17 that Paul wrote, and this was controversial in that day. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. The idea that was prevalent was that Rome holds everything together. What Paul is saying is no, Jesus holds everything together. By him, all things consist. 476 AD, Rome fell. Col Colossae is no longer there. Paul had a heart for Rome. He was proud of his citizenship, but his hope was Jesus. So there's an upward hope, but then Paul turns the corner here to an inward prayer, an inward prayer. Now this is, what we're going to read next is one of four prison prayers by the Apostle Paul. Uh, we find two of them in Ephesians, chapter number one and chapter number three. We find one in Philippians, and then we find the last one here in the book of Colossians. By the way, if you're just learning how to pray, this is a great blueprint that we're going to we're going to read through tonight on how that we should pray, how we should pray. Verse number nine, for this cause, we also cease the day, uh, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Now, just quick note here. What we're going to study for the next few verses is really just one continuous verse. Paul knows how to pack a lot of truth into one verse. He did the same thing in Ephesians chapter number one. He's going to pack a lot of truth here in this, in this one sentence, right? In verse number nine, nine uh, the the, the the subject and verb are we and cease. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And to the desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Have you ever been asked by someone, can I pray for you? Or maybe more specifically, how can I pray for you? I've been asked that a number of times, even by members of our own church. And sometimes, depending on the moment that you catch me, I, I've got a number of prayer requests that I could rattle off my tongue. There's other moments where I'm like, I'm, I, I'm running, I, I blank out, right? What, what is it that you can pray with me for? This is a good response here in Colossians chapter 1. Have you ever prayed for someone like this? What, what do I mean by like this? Well, first of all, we see in his prayers that Paul's prayers were constant. His prayers were constant. Let me say this, by the way, if you're a guest here, maybe you're in high school and you had, a, you had a chaperone that brought you, maybe a youth pastor, maybe a parent, and they're, they're here to see you. I, I bet if we were to talk to them that their heart mirrors here the heart of the Apostle Paul. Right. To see Christ formed in you. Let me ask the chaperones, are you praying for maybe a son or a daughter, a teen in your youth group like the Apostle Paul was praying here for these believers? How was he praying constantly? And by the way, it's not only the Apostle Paul, Jesus in Hebrews 7.25, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You know, Jesus is praying on your behalf right now. Robert Murray McShane said, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. Amen. Isn't that true? So Jesus is making intercession. Jesus is praying, not just Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Read of this in Romans chapter number eight, that the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. Listen, you've got uh, young adults that are here, teenagers, you've got parents that are praying for you. 
You got maybe one parent or two parents or maybe a youth pastor, whoever brought you. Maybe you have a teacher or a coach or a good friend. I believe often we can attribute growth in our lives to the grace of God and the prayers of others. And so for the Holy Spirit's praying, Jesus is praying. This is a constant prayer. We ought to be constant in our prayers. This prayer was also specific. Not just I'm praying for you. The Apostle Paul then spells out how I am praying for you. Here's, what, here's his prayer. And to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So this was personal that ye, you, he hadn't met these individuals, but he had a heart for them. And he, his prayers for these new believers was for them to grow and be filled in the knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So these, these prayers, they were constant. These prayers were specific. These prayers were spiritual. I think it's a good thing to bring our requests before the Lord. And, and we do this, we do this uh, daily, even here on staff, we'll go through prayer lists and prayer requests. And sometimes the first things that are mentioned are physical ailments and physical needs. And aren't you glad that we have a Heavenly Father that we can boldly run to with any request, any petition, anything that's heavy on our heart or anything that we're ailment that we're dealing with in our life. But don't make your prayers only about physical ailments. Maybe it's a financial burden and certainly we can cast all our care upon him. But don't, don't only just pray about that. When's the last time you, pray, you prayed and the, the topic of your prayer, the point of your prayer was a spiritual point. It's for spiritual growth. What, what did Paul pray here? That they would be filled with the knowledge of his will. He wants these new believers to grow in their faith. And that means that they begin to grow in their knowledge. Change begins in the mind to change how they think, how they think about their sins. To be filled with the knowledge of his will. You, you know, in, in our youth group sometimes, or I know sometimes as, as a college student, I remember a lot of conversations about the will of God. And there's mysterious aspects of the will of God. But can I tell you something? There's a clear aspect to the will of God. To know the precepts that he's given us to do. The commands that he's given us to. To, to be filled with the knowledge of what? What knowledge? The knowledge of his will. This word in scripture we know, and Paul uses it elsewhere, to be controlled. To be filled means to be controlled. If I'm filled with anger, I'm controlled by anger. If I'm filled with bitterness, because Brother Fleming didn't bring me coffee this afternoon, I'm controlled by that bitterness. If I'm filled with Wine, I'm controlled by that wine. But if I'm filled with the Spirit, I'm controlled with this, by the Spirit. And so to be filled means to be controlled. So to be filled with the knowledge of God means that you are controlled by the knowledge of His will. You see, there's a direct action associated with that. It's just not head knowledge for the point of head knowledge. It's so that you can be filled with the knowledge of His will for the purpose of living out His will for your life. God's will is not abstract. We see in Scripture the, 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 the decrees of God. This is sometimes what we call to, uh, what we call the, the sovereign will of God. These are things that God does without taking a poll. The flood, creation, these are things that he sovereignly decreed. Why? Because it was his will. But in Scripture, we also find the revealed will of God. The desires of his will for our life. We don't have to pray about these things, whether God wants us to do these things. And, and 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and everything give thanks. Why? Because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Don't have to pray about that. That is the will of God for your life and for my life. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, for this is the will of God. We can go on and on. This is the revealed will of God. This is, and here's what happens sometimes. I do believe that God has a, a personal will. This is the direction that God is going to lead you in your life. This applies to everyone, but specifically to the young people in here. Don't get so enamored with that direction. How is God leading me? And sometimes we even attach a location. Because listen, what does it matter if you go to the right location? If you're not living in the revealed will of God. If you're not obeying his commands and his precepts, you could, you could marry the right person, but you're not the right person. God's not going to bless that marriage. 
If God's will is that you abstain from fornication and you find the right person, but that you don't follow the clear, direct will of God, God's not going to bless that. So I, I truly believe that God created you. He has a plan for your life. It's special. It's specific to you. I think you should learn, as Dr. Shetler says here, that you should discover your God, develop your gifts. I think God has a place and a purpose for you, but don't overlook the specific will of God as revealed in Scripture. So there is the knowledge of God to be filled with the knowledge of his will. And by the way, you don't get that apart from the word of God. Knowledge of the will of God comes from walking in, with the word, in the word of God. And so if, if God's will is a little hazy to you, get back into his word. His word gives clarity to us. His word is a light unto our path. So there's filled with knowledge of his will, but then there's wisdom. What is this? This is knowledge applied to your life. This is the application of knowledge. This is something that only God can give. And then there's understanding here in, in this passage. We read of uh, spiritual understanding. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the, the insight to know uh, how to apply that wisdom. This is the, the discernment. Spurgeon said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Let me show you this period, this uh, py uh, pyramid here. At the bottom of the pyramid, we see data. There's a lot of data in our world. Uh, there's some people even on staff here in the church and in the college that are really, we were in a meeting today and my mind was blown uh, by Mrs. Stoner. She was going through some data, some really awesome reports from this past Sunday. She was making the connection. She knew what to do with that data. So some people like Mrs. Stoner can take that data and they can process that information, right? So there's a lot of data in this world. There's a lot of information in the world. Go to, go to the internet. The information is all there. What is not all there all the time is knowledge. Have you ever met someone that, that they had access to information, but man, they, they didn't unlock that information, right? Uh, they, 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 didn't, they didn't have that knowledge. But let me tell you what you only get from God is wisdom. There are, there are colleges around our world that have more data than we would have right here, more information, a lot of knowledge. But when you divorce knowledge from wisdom, the results are devastating. That's, right. That's what we see in our country today. We see a lot of really smart people, the GPAs. I mean, it's, to even get into an Ivy League school is like, wow, the knowledge. But what you won't get there, but you do get in God's word is wisdom. So Paul's prayer for these new believers is that they would grow in the knowledge of his will, but also grow in knowledge and spiritual understanding. Church family, our church family here, when's the last time that you prayed for someone else in this way? For, the, for brother so-and-so or Mrs. so-and-so or, or, or for someone in our youth group, that they would be filled with knowledge, filled with wisdom, filled with that discernment. See, there's this upward hope. That is our expectation. That is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ because of the gospel that we've been given. That's our upward hope, right? And that gives us a confidence to walk forward. But then there's that inner hope, that inner expectation that God's going to do something in my life. When's the last time you've desired that for yourself personally, or you've prayed for someone else to experience that as well? So there's an upward hope. There's an inward prayer. But then let me finally draw your attention here to this outward ministry, this outward ministry. Now, this is a continued prayer. So we're still in Apostle Paul's uh, prayer here. And he's praying for continued growth, doing the will of God, not just knowing, but doing the will of God. You see, the end goal is not just knowledge in itself. The end goal is that Christ would be magnified. You go to the end of this passage in verse number 27, we read, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know what's so awesome? To be used by God, to be a partaker in what God is doing. It's a word we'll see here in just a moment. So let's continue reading verse number 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now there's that phrase real quick. So let's, let's touch on this, this, this knowledge of God. This is not new knowledge. We went this past year to uh, the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. That was a cool place to take our, our girls. My, my girls loved it. But right before we had gone there, we went to Amish country. 
So we went to Amish country, and Blair, uh, my middle child, she's eight years old, she, she decided she wanted to be Amish. And I was thinking, good, good luck, I'll sign the papers, that'll be fun to see, you know? She's like, I want to be Amish. She saw some Amish girls, and so we bought her a little bonnet, and she wanted to be Amish. Then we went to Washington, D.C., DC and we took her to the Spy Museum. And so guess what she wanted to be after we went to the Spy Museum? You guessed it. She wanted to be an Amish spy. <laughs> and I told her, that's, that's actually perfect. They will never suspect you. You would be a great <laughs> Amish spy. But in the Spy Museum, there's, a, there's up, on the, up on the wall, there's this uh, phrase here that says, knowledge, now you know. I think we might have a picture of it. Now you know. Now you know. And they, they show you all these uh, spy techniques that they used during the Cold War and things I didn't know. But when you leave, they're like, wow, now you know. It was like this new revelation. Well, listen, uh, God has revealed himself to us, and there's no new knowledge. The knowledge we have of God is in his word. Amen. But there is deep knowledge. Amen. And that's what the apostle Paul is doing. He's, he's being redundant. He's repeating himself. No, the first time... He spoke of the knowledge of the will of God. Now he's speaking of knowledge of God himself. Isn't it awesome to walk away from a message or time in God's word just with a deeper understanding and appreciation for who God is? We saw many people saved on Sunday, and that was pretty awesome to see people accept Christ as their Savior because now they have a relationship with Jesus. They know Jesus. If you've accepted Christ, you know Jesus. But do you you know him deeply? And that's what the Apostle Paul is. He's praying for these individuals that they would know not just God's will. They would walk in that will and that they would know God deeply. So here's a few thoughts here. A few takeaways. We should recognize the significance of our calling. We are told here in verse number 10 that ye might walk worthy of the Lord. Have you ever done something and you were, after, after you did whatever you, you did, someone asked you, well, was it worth it? Maybe you went on a big diet or maybe you went on a big trip or maybe you did something that was really tough. Maybe you ran a marathon. Someone says, well, was it worth it? I've been asked that question before. Maybe, teenager, you, uh, you stood in a long line for a ride at Six Flags. And after you stood four hours, someone's like, well, was it worth it? We've all gotten that question before. Can I tell you something? The song we heard at the beginning, Well Done, no one will say it wasn't worth it. Amen. It's worth it. It is a worthy calling. It is a high calling. Recognize the significance that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, meaning unto all pleasing, meaning every aspect of your life. We like to compartmentalize our life. And this is, I'm doing well in this area. Let's, let's ignore this area over here. But that we might walk worthy in every aspect, in every area of our life pleasing to him. There is an implication here that if we are told to walk worthy, the implication is that there's another walk that is unworthy. There is another walk that is not becoming of the gospel in our lives. This is when the practice of your faith doesn't match the profession of your faith. And we've all heard and seen devastating stories, scandalous stories along these lines. When someone professed one thing, but then their actions didn't match up. The the imagery here in scripture is of of a scale. When you're weighing the two things out and there's an imbalance, they don't don't match. Your beliefs and your behavior, they they don't line up. That's that's unworthy and unbecoming of the gospel. I remember hearing a news story some time ago about how many of uh, uh, President Obama's secret service agents after a trip were fired. Uh, This is an Atlantic article that talked about a timeline of disaster. Why? Because they were doing things that secret servant agents, uh, no matter who the president is, Democrat or Republican, shouldn't be doing. It wasn't becoming of the office. And so they were fired. They were terminated because it wasn't working. Now listen, if there's a way to walk that's becoming of the president of the United States, for us as believers, there's a way that we can walk that is becoming of the gospel that we have received. That we walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Listen, our aim is to please him. Like I said, it's worth it. Recognize the significance of our calling. And to all pleasing, this is something to note. When my children, when they do something that I tell them not to do or they directly disobey me or they have an attitude, there are many times where I'm not pleased, but I never love them less. They're never not my child. 
God loves us just the same. If you are a believer, you'll never lose that relationship. No man can pluck you out of his hands. But we can do things that are not pleasing to God. We can do things that are not becoming of the gospel. And so Paul here, as he prays, he's praying them for them to be filled with the knowledge of his will, to be filled with the knowledge of God, and to walk worthy of this high calling of Jesus Christ. Second takeaway here is to rest in the power of his strength. Someone once said that the Christian life isn't hard, it's impossible. We can't do the Christian life in our own strength. Uh, you may be here tonight, and maybe you'll be challenged over the next few days to, to consider Bible college. You're like, well, I could never move across the country. I could never, I could never pay a bill like that. Dr. R, one of my favorite parts of college days is the tough questions that come at the end of the college days. I'm glad that I don't have to answer all those tough questions. Sometimes there are tough questions, but listen, with God's calling comes God's enabling. All you have to ask yourself is this, has God called me to do this? If the answer is yes, then that's it. Because if God called you, God will enable you. We rest in his power and in his strength strengthened with all might. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm weak. In my weakness, he is strong. Strengthened in, uh, with all might, w according to his glorious power. Not my glorious power, but his glorious power. Under all patience and long suffering. I mean, listen, maybe you're here in your college student, maybe you're in your sophomore, junior, or senior year, and you're like, yeah, I heard this message a few years ago, and I signed up, and I'm here, and it's tough now. No one promised that it wouldn't be tough. But what is promised is that he'll see us through it with long suffering and patience. Recognize the significance of your calling. Rest in his power. And then finally, rejoice in what God accomplishes through you. We read this a few times here, the, the fruitfulness of the work. The fruitful. Now, to be clear, we don't bear the fruit. It is Christ who brings the fruit. God brings the fruit. But we, uh, uh, we are the vine, he is the branches. Apart from him, we can do nothing. He is the vine, we are the branches. Got that mixed up. Listen, he includes us. We are partakers in this privilege of serving him. Listen, this applies to whether you're serving in full-time ministry, whether you're preparing a full-time minister uh, ministry, or you are a faithful layperson of Lancaster Baptist Church. We can all be fruitful in our work because of his grace and goodness in our life, being fruitful under every good work. I think of the fruit of evangelism. We saw that this past week, souls coming to know Christ. The Bible speaks of this fruit. I think of the fruit of edification that Paul wrote about in the book of Romans and, and seeing others encouraged. We can rejoice in what God accomplishes through you. Let's finish up here in verse number 11 and 12. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, into all patience and love and suffering, listen, with joyfulness. And that thought continues into verse number 12. Giving thanks unto the Father. Okay, so the point of verse number 12 is that when we give thanks to the Father and as we give thanks to the Father, we can do that with joy. We don't find joy just in the outcome. We find joy in serving. The joy really here is connected to verse number 12. Giving thanks to the Father to be used by God to express gratitude that, like, God, you used me in this endeavor. My presentation was sloppy, but they got saved. Uh, my coworker was able to come to work. I didn't think I could ever teach a class like I taught, but I taught that. And the glory goes to God. And when you give thanks to God, that's where the joy comes in our life. Rest in the power of his strength and then, his strength, and then rejoice in what God accomplishes through you. This wonderful word, partaker. Isn't that a great word? That we get to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. I'll end with this quote. C.S. Lewis said, Christianity, if, of, if false, is of no importance. If true, of infinite importance. The only thing that it cannot be is moderately important. What we've read here tonight, this this prayer for growth, this desire to grow, this, this upward expectation, this inward expectation, this outward expectation, it's a significant. Not because we're significant, but because he is significant. And by 
Him, all things consist. He doesn't need us. By Him, not by Him plus us. By Him, all things consist. And yet, He invites us to be a partaker in what He is doing. 